Hello, my friends. My name is Darren Gertis, and here are the three big stories for today. So the Verkhana Rada, that's the parliament in Ukraine, has passed a mobilization bill, and here it is, 283 to 1. And if you Google Translate it, uh, for it were 283 against it were was one i'm not sure what hold on means uh they did not vote 18 total of 351 but really it's a total of 283 to one um so let's look at this. This is uh, Radio Free Europe talking about it. The law expands the powers of Ukrainian authorities to issue draft notices, including through an electronic system, a change that's expected to help evasion. The measure was passed with 283 votes out of 450 members. Wait a minute, 450? We saw 351 total with the did not vote. Like where were the other uh, more than 100 Folks, I, I, I'm not understanding this. Uh, the provision of the demobilization of those currently serving in the armed forces was scrapped from the law. That was key, and that tells you that they need that. Um, they could have theoretically maybe had 500,000 and allowed some to go home, but they didn't go down that particular path. It's a move that will likely be met with anger by Ukrainian troops and their families. I understand. One of its provisions requires men between the ages of 18 and 60 to update their personal information within 60 days. It's kind of like selective service within the United States. Okay, Ukrainian MPs passed controversial mobilization bill to boost troop numbers. The numbers needed are lower than the 500,000 initially thought, but that's because they're not sending people home. That's part of it, um, though the exact figure has not been spelled out. Many will be 25 and 26-year-old men, so they reduced that from 27 to 25. Now, that sounds weird to our minds in the United States because we say, oh, 18, you're an adult, you should be able to go. They think about it differently. They think until about age 27, that's what it used to be, you're ineligible, you're not you, you will not be called up to fight because you should be living life, going to college, uh, getting your education, uh, starting a family, having children, that sort of thing. And they don't want to lose an entire generation. But they've lowered it now to 25. 25 and 26-year-old men eligible for enforced enlistment for the first time. A demobilization clause that would have allowed soldiers to leave after 36 months was excluded. And that's, that's going to not be very popular. It attracted more than 4,000 amendments in a contentious debate that finally ended on Thursday as it passed a second reading. Some key provisions have already been signed into law by the president, but this isn't in foreshed. Zelensky has to sign this particular bill. Younger men from the age of 18 will be able to volunteer for the military, but they cannot be pressed into frontline service. And the maximum age of 60 remains unchanged. 60-year-olds. So think about a 59-year-old on the battlefield. It's You're in a different place than when you were 20. Okay, a uh, fresh row broke out on Wednesday after the demobilization clause was dropped. The defense ministry said relieving soldiers was an issue. It's clear that people who have been fighting since the beginning and holding the line of defense are getting tired and exhausted. I'm sure that's an understatement. Okay, let's look at uh, big story number two. Ukraine will be outgunned by Russia 10 to 1 within weeks without U.S. help, says the, this is the top general, his name is Cavoli. He's a top general of Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, uh, in, in NATO. Okay. The top general for U.S. forces in Europe told Congress on Wednesday that Ukraine will be outgunned 10 to 1 by Russia within a matter of weeks if Congress does not find a way to approve sending more ammunition and weapons to Kyiv soon. They are now being outshot by the Russian side five to one, so the Russians fire five times as many artillery shells at the Ukrainians than the Ukrainians are able to fire back. That will immediately go to ten to one in a matter of weeks. He said, we are not talking about months, we are not talking hypothetically. Okay. I want to look at this. Um, so the article goes on just a little bit more and then we'll shift gears. Cavoli told lawmakers that in this conflict, the U.S. flow of 155 millimeter artillery shells has been a lifeline. The biggest killer on the battlefield is artillery. That's very clear. That happens a lot of the time in war, but it's particularly true here. In most conflicts, but in this one, definitely, and it should Ukraine run out, they would run out because we've stopped supplying, because we've we supply the lion's share of that. Now, the Europeans are trying to raise some, but it 
I mean, they have to get their act together too. Okay, that's the end of this article. So let's look at a recap of everything that he said. This gentleman has done a great job recapping what was said. Very insightful points from General Cavoli's statement today. Ukraine cannot sustain this fight alone. The United States, our allies and partners must continue to provide Ukraine with munitions, weapons, and materiel. That's piece one. Number two, Russia relies on mass and quantity available to a large country, and despite its military's evident deficiencies and dysfunctions, it continues to pose an ex existential threat to Ukraine. So mass, they carpet bomb like with artillery. They just d destroy everything in front of it with lots of artillery, as opposed to pinpoint kind of targeting. They they just they will wipe something out and then wipe out the next street and then wipe out the next street and then just keep going. Um, that's how they fight. During this conflict, Russia's strategic forces, long-range aviation, cyber capabilities, space capabilities, and capabilities in the electromagnetic spectrum have lost no capability at all. The Air Force has lost some aircraft, but only about 10% of their fleet. So Russia is still reasonably healthy enough to continue to fight for a long time. Likewise, the Navy has suffered significantly in the Black Sea, but nowhere else, and Russian naval activity worldwide is at a significant peak. So this is a different picture than what you might have gotten if you if you watch like you you don't want to watch UA tubers who are just only positive. They they have to be giving you the negative information as well, or you're going to be blindsided by this kind of thing. Uh, Russia has suffered losing over 2,000 tanks and 315,000 soldiers, and of course Ukraine's estimates are far higher than that. Ukraine's estimates are upwards of 450,000 wounded or dead. The, the American figures are much more conservative. However, Russia is reconstituting that force far faster than our initial estimates suggested. In fact, the army is larger now by 15% than it was when it invaded Ukraine. So. They've reconstituted. Now, whether they have great fighting acumen is a different question, but they have reconstituted their force, and there are lots of Russians in Ukraine. Over the past year, Russia has increased its frontline troop strengths from 360,000 to 470,000. Regardless of the outcome of this war in Ukraine, Russia will be larger and angrier with the West than it was when it invaded. And there's this weird axis of evil creating, kind of coming together, gelling together between uh, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and to some degree China. And it's, it's not pretty. Okay. Last little bit, the European Parliament refused to approve funding for the EU Council until Ukraine receives new patriots. This was beautiful. Finally, somebody's doing something and forcing the hand in the EU. Longtime member of the European Parliament and former Belgian Prime Minister uh, of the Renew faction proposed to remove the approval of the European Council budget from the agenda until member states can find the seven patriot systems that Ukraine desperately needs. Gerhoff's staff recalled the words of the head of the European diplomacy that European countries have a hundred patriot systems, while Ukraine needs seven. His proposal was greeted with thunderous applause. The decision was called an unprecedented event. It was supported by 515 members of parliament with 62 against. So let's hear what he had to say. The European Union, but I'm not capable to do so. And my proposal to you, Mr. President, is that we in any way, all these discharges of all these institutions, 55 in total, that we put them on the next agenda in Strasbourg. And before we don't discharge them, until the council, who can easily make an agreement on that, do a meeting to deliver these seven patriot systems to Ukraine. At least the discharge of the council, at least I propose that the discharge of the council is withdrawn of the agenda. Thank you very much. Well, it looks like it worked. The European Parliament blocks EU council budget until Ukraine gets patriots. It was decided to block the approval of the budget. With a vote taken in 515 members of the European Parliament for and only 62 against, the motion to refuse to discharge the EU Council's budget until European leaders agree to support Ukraine with additional Patriot air defense systems was adopted. So how about that? Okay, last little bit. Uh, this 
afternoon, Greg Terry and I started talking about, like, we were trying to put our heads together, figure out what is going on, because there's some very weird things. And then later in the uh, video, Johnny Pierce joined us as well. And we were just trying to understand, like, why would they be talking about, like, don't hit oil? And, and like, while Russia is just destroying uh, energy facilities. Well, here I'm going to show just a, a clip of them talking and then what happened at the very end. Our killing civilians and secondly they are really we're one more mass attack away johnny from from critical on the energy front i fully agree so that I, I, that's what i was listening to you say that earlier and i'm 100 percent in agreement i was saying that in my video earlier today that that you, they can do this last night they can do it again and they mm -hmm. can do it again and it's only the amount of Kinjal missiles they can produce. But if they can knock out a, a power plant every time they do this, Ukraine is screwed. Like this, yeah. this is. I am way more like worried now and 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 annoyed and everything than I have been for a long time. And I don't know that other people are taking it as seriously as they should. We were just well, simply testing. Johnny, I got. Go ahead. Go ahead. Doctor. I've got to go in two minutes because I have to run off to this workshop I'm conducting. Um, so what do you think of my theory that um, maybe Lloyd Austin and the undersecretary are saying what they're saying because they want to slow things down because they know that nothing's getting there. They know that they, Congress isn't providing it. The West isn't providing it. Nothing's on its way. There, there's no cavalry coming to the rescue. So now, by the way, I came up with this theory while we were talking with uh, Greg, like as we were just putting our heads together, trying to understand what was going on. That's where, so I could be totally wrong about this, but that's kind of what dawned on me as we were having this discussion. So they're trying Ooh. to, that's why they're trying to tamp it down. That's it's a, right. It's, that's interesting. So that makes, interestingly, I've not thought about this. So it's a post hoc rationalization, which means an after the fact rationalization to to kind of explain away how impotent Congress are being. Is that what you mean? Yeah. So they're, well, it's not just okay. that, but they recognize going forward, we're not getting anything to you. We don't have any means of getting anything to you anytime soon. So you got to stop doing this because that's provoking them. And that's, I, I, I think. Yeah. So it's part of the, I'm um, sorry, part of the uh, escalation narrative escalation narrative really but but m more in line with not general escalation but escalation in light of the fact that the u.s can't help and uh, right. possibly the administration are recognizing that congress isn't going to help either like we've seen mike, mike johnson not to do anything for two days as uh, greg said correctly earlier which is like what he promised to do he's just routinely stated things and then gone against what he stated so i don't think mm -hmm. we can trust him anymore I, that's really interesting thought because something has to make sense of it. They're not going to be saying stuff for for what we say in the UK shits and giggles. Sorry to swear, but um, like that that is is not it's not just for a laugh. So there must be some rationale behind what they're saying, and it's trying to work yeah. out what is the most plausible theory. Yeah, and that's and that, that, that's what happened to scratch in my head, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. No, that's okay. So at that point, I, in a minute or so, had to leave. I had to flee from my class, but Greg and I were live streaming and then we were live streaming through my channel. So I had to leave. And what happened next was, well, they continued the conversation and apparently it said Darren Gertis here for Johnny, but that's okay. Uh, but, but when they were leaving, you got to watch this. World, et cetera, et cetera. So that'll be interesting. Uh, Darren, it's been nice to be on here with you. Sitting in the car. <laughs> You have Darren Gertis on the uh, thing. Yeah, thanks, y'all. Uh, awesome stuff, man. I love, I love me some Reagan. <laughs> I love me some Reagan. Wait, I'm gonna clip that. I'm gonna clip that. No, but okay. Here. Also, when he said, "Hey, y'all," I don't talk like that. But the love Reagan part—that he got that correct. So, okay, that's all that I have. Thank you for the likes, the shares, the subscribes, and the coffees. And thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.